We will dance till the chains fall off. We will dance till the chains fall off. Oh, we will dance till the chains fall off. The whole earth sings your praise. 
need a breakthrough for something, don't think about it, don't question it. If you need a breakthrough for something, I want to invite you to this altar. See, the enemy has kept some of you so silent and so fearful that fear and that worry and that intimidator has stood in front of you. But I want to tell you the breakthrough anointing is in the room this morning. And I'm telling you, he's strong in battle. He's mighty in battle. The God who parts the Red Sea in front of an impossible situation is here in this room this morning. And, and we just thank you, Father, that you're here to meet your people. Come on, let's press in. Press in this morning. Father, we thank you that there are breakthroughs that are happening all over this room today. That there are physical, that there are mental, that there are financial, that there are things going on in this atmosphere that heaven is declaring over us today. And we declare that that breakthrough is sweeping in and through us. We thank you, Father, that the Spirit of the Lord is here for victory. We declare you are strong in battle. You are mighty in wonders and father we come to you this morning and we declare that there is a victory in this atmosphere there is a breakthrough for every person who's here today and father we declare those open doors would be those closed doors would begin to open up we declare those things that look impossible are not too hard for our god today we declare impossible situations to turn around we declare strongholds to be broken. We declare life to come to those who are spiritually dead today. We thank you that there's a resurrection that's coming to those who are spiritually dead. We breathe, we declare and we breathe life on those dry bones and we say, you will live. You will live in Jesus' name.
walking through some situations that you don't know how to navigate. But this is a prophetic song right here. You're going to praise through. God is going to put a song in your heart. He's, you're going to wake up in the morning and that song's going to be on your heart. You're going to be driving down the road and your mind is going to be wondering, what do I do? What do I do? And all of a sudden that song is going to rise up in your spirit. And I want to tell you today, that's your weapon of breakthrough. That's your weapon of breakthrough. Every time the enemy comes with fear and distraction, every time the enemy comes to tell you that it's not going to happen, that song is going to rise up. So as we just go back into that song again, I want you to know that they always sent the worshipers first, that there was a victory on the other side of their worship. There was a victory on the other side of their shout. So I want to tell you today that your voice is powerful and your praise brings breakthrough. It brings breakthrough after breakthrough so let that song rise up within you
Your eyes are like flames of fire. I know that your hair is white as wool. I know that your voice sounds like water. Jesus, you're beautiful. And I know that your eyes are like flames of fire. I know that your hair is white as wool. I know that your voice sounds like water. Jesus, you're beautiful. I know that your eyes are like flames of fire. I know that your hair is white as wool. I know that your voice is sounds like one. Jesus, you're beautiful. Yeah. 
yield to you this morning. And I'm reminded of that scripture in Psalm 32 that just says, just willfully come with me. Don't make it hard. And there's a surrender, I believe, that the Holy Spirit is asking some of us. Just say yes. You don't have to make it hard. I just do that, Lord. I don't, I don't want to put anything in front of you. I don't want any areas of my heart that aren't open to you. I surrender them all to you. Thank you, Lord. We put you first, Jesus. First place. Thank you. As we were worshiping, I saw these storm clouds that look pretty scary. They look pretty turbulent. But as we just kept worshiping, this is what I saw. I saw the horizon. And I'm going to tell you, it was bright. And it was full of wonder. And the sun had come out. Kind of reminds me of that song, Out Came the Sun and Dried Up All the Rain. I'm going to tell you, you may be walking through a storm right now, but the horizon that the Lord has for you, the sun is shining. And there's breakthrough. That's why I felt, felt like that song was so powerful. Don't stop in the storm. I've heard that saying before that every storm runs out of rain. 
Sometimes we just stop and stay there. But if you will just keep pressing on, keep trusting in the promises that the Lord has given you, if you will just keep worshiping, I'm telling you the horizon has the promises that God has for you. It has every word that He's given you, every scripture that He's put on your heart. All of those things are out there. And the sky is going to begin to break. And the sun is going to come out. And there's going to be joy on the other side of this. Whatever you're walking through right now, there doesn't feel like there's any joy. And how could there ever be joy in my life again? But I want to tell you today, there's joy on the other side of this storm. Joy's coming in the morning. Breakthrough is coming. The promises and the plans of God are coming for your life. Let me declare that to you today. The promises that God has for you, they're coming in your life. The enemy can't steal them. The circumstances that you're in right now can't block them. Nothing is too hard for God. So we thank you for that this morning. And we thank you, Holy Spirit. That's why we're yielding. I feel like that's why it's so important. In the storm, we don't want to yield. We want to be in control. But I'm telling you right now, if you will just yield those areas of your heart to the Lord... If you'll just trust Him, even when it's dark, and even when it's cloudy, and even when there's thunder, even when the enemy sounds so loud, and there's even that lightning where it looks like it's all over, I'm telling you, it's not over. Thank you, Lord. He's a rescuer. I'm telling you, He came for me when I was not looking for Him. That's how good He is. His word says he rescues us because he delights in us. If you need the rescuer this morning, just lift your hands and just tell him, I need you. I need you, Jesus. I need you more than I have ever needed you before. You are my first love. And I trust you. You are more faithful than anyone I've ever met, and I trust you. Thank you, Jesus. And Lord, we just make room for you to do those things this week. I believe some of you are going to have breakthrough this week. Amen? Amen. Can we give the Lord a hand clap? Thank you, Lord. A special word that I've been thinking about since the summer. So over the summer, my family and I, we went to the ramp. And the first word I heard that night was personal revival. And ever since the summer, I've just been like praying about it, like thinking about it. And so I'm going to just share with, it, share with you guys today about what I thought about it. So the first thing I did whenever I got home was I looked up on Google what personal revival meant. And Google says, personal revival is a new intake of life, a new realization of the power of Christ. And I thought that was a pretty good example, but I felt like there was something deeper that God was trying to tell me about it. So a couple nights ago, I started praying about it. I was like, God, what do you really mean whenever you were telling me what personal revival is? And here's exactly what he said. He said, personal revival is a mover shift in your personal life that sets you ablaze for God. A shift that tells your brain, I will never be the same again, and I can't stop moving forward. And I thought that was so crazy because Carmen actually bought us these journals whenever we went to the ramp. And the first two things I wrote down in that was, you'll never be the same again, and I won't be able to stop moving forward for the kingdom of God. And I just thought that was so amazing because that summer was like months ago. And that word that he told me came to like life like a couple nights ago whenever God told me that. So someone that I think about in the Bible that had personal revival was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So we all know the story how they were told that they had to go and praise to these gods. And the thing was, everyone around them started doing it. And I feel like that kind of happens in our lives sometimes. Everyone starts sinning because the world tells us if everyone's doing it, then maybe it is okay. The world starts lying to us and tells us, oh, it's okay because everyone else is doing it. So sometimes the stuff that's bad doesn't always seem like it's so bad. And that's just what the world tries to do. Well, the thing is, that's exactly what happened to them. Everyone started praising these gods even though they knew it wasn't right. And the thing is, sometimes in our life, we don't want to go and be different because we're scared of what other people will say about us. Well, it was different in their case. They were faced with death. If they didn't, write, if they didn't go and praise these gods, they were, going to be, they were going to be killed in this furnace. But still, their personal revival set them apart, and they weren't killed because God was right there with them every step of the way. 
So one thing I want to talk about before I get into this is Matthew 6, 1 through 3. And it says, Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of people, just to be seen by them. Otherwise, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So whenever you give to the poor, don't sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogue and on the streets, to be applauded by people. I assure you, they've got their reward. And I just thought that went along with this so well, because I feel like sometimes people try to act like they have this amazing relationship with God, just so that other people will see that. And for personal revival, you can't have a personal revival if it's fake. You can't fake your faith. It is between you and God, and it's an inward thing. So every single revivalist that has ever done anything had a revival. There's actually pictures of them whenever you walk down the hall. And every single one of those people had to have a personal revival within themselves. It was an inside job before it ever became a revival for everyone else. So I have four steps that can spark personal revival, so I'm going to share them with you guys today. So first one is pour his word into your heart and mind. I feel like that's so important, and Sadie Robertson talks about this all the time. I love Sadie. And what she was taught, I watched one of her message, and it's called What is Truth? It's on YouTube if you guys want to go watch it. It's really good. And she said, whenever you read the Bible, you can learn and like hear the truth. Because sometimes, like I was talking about earlier, whenever we get into the world, the world starts telling us these lies, and those lies become so normalized that they start to become the truth in our mind. But Sadie always talks about you have to go back to the Word because the Word affirms you. It tells you who you are. Because sometimes the world will try and tell you things that you're not, and you start to believe maybe that is true. But the thing is, the Word of God tells you who your Creator is and who you are and what your worth is. So reading the Bible affirms who you are. I think of it like Evan Roberts. I love him so much. He, um, as a kid, he spent hours and hours a day memorizing scripture. And he didn't just read the Bible. He, like, grained it into his mind so that he would know it, like, from front to back. So he cultivated a heart for God every single day. He started a personal revival by reading his word every single day. So the thing is, he had a personal revival whenever he was younger before he ever started any real revival. The second thing is immerse yourself in prayer. I think this is so important because that is how you develop a personal relationship with God. And I personally, I think prayer prepares your heart. And what I mean by that is whenever you have a personal revival, the enemy's going to see that and he's going to definitely go after it. He's going to try to put temptation in front of you. He's going to try to attack you. So whenever you pray to God, you're preparing your heart so that whenever you have a close relationship with God, he won't let the enemy touch you. For example, I tell my mom and dad everything about my life so that whenever, if I have something come up, they know how to help me. But if I didn't have a close relationship with my parents, they wouldn't be able to help me. The third thing is to get rid of distractions. What I mean by that is you have to get rid of people, places, activities, and anything that holds you back from becoming the best version of you for God. And I feel like, I talked about this last time I preached, people that can hold you back from who you're supposed to be because sometimes they get jealous or insecure of what your potential can be because they see inside of you. So they try to pull you back away from that. So you have to be careful that you have good people in your life, people that will push you forward not hold you back. You have to be careful that places you go, what are they hosting? What are they honoring there? Because stuff like that can hold you back. Activities, things you go and do with your friends, things you go and do with your family, that can hold you back from God. So I love this quote, and it says, starve the flesh by feeding the spirit. I think that's so important that whenever we start taking away all the bad things in our life, we have to fill fill up our spirit. So I think of it like this. Whenever you're on a diet, first of all, you have to start taking away all the bad foods that you eat. But you can't just not eat. You have to start feeding yourself good, positive things that you get into a good diet. So I think this is so important. Never let anyone or anything keep you out of his presence. So I'm going to talk about this for a second. Like I was saying earlier, certain people, they try everything they can do to stop you from going after your calling because they're scared of the potential inside of you. So you have to be careful who you put your trust in. And what I mean by that is whenever you have a personal revival, it's always good to like talk to people about it, but it's so important that you don't base their opinion on your personal revival on what they say. Because I feel like sometimes people define who they are by what other people say about them. So... Also, you can't rely on anyone for your relationship with God. And here's what I kind of think of it as. Sometimes people, whenever they're first starting off, they want to almost mimic how other people's relationship with God is. So I think of it like this. I love Sadie Robertson. I love her relationship with God. But I don't go out and say, okay, I'm going to do everything that Sadie does so that my relationship looks just like that. It's good to, that she influences me, that she's a positive influence. But I don't try to mimic who she is because... For example, one time I knew this girl, and she has she was just starting off her relationship with God, and she didn't really know what to do. So what she did is she started looking up to an older influence, and she was listening to her, and she was doing everything that she was doing, and her relationship with God was going good. 
But then the older girl started falling back away from God. She started going out and doing some things that maybe weren't right. And so the girl thought, okay, well, she's doing this. So she's still a Christian. She still has a good relationship with God. So maybe I can do this. And the thing is, she was relying on her, the other girl, for her relationship with God. So I think it's so important that you have a difference between being influenced and mimicking someone else's relationship with God. And another thing is, people are fickle. They change. Um, I talk about this all the time. I'm going to read you all something that Sadie wrote in this book. She says, Stop relying on other people for your sense of value and stop letting their opinions determine what you think about yourself. So if you determine what other people are saying about your relationship with God, then you can't have personal value because you're including all these other people when really it's an inside job. It's between you and God. So the fourth thing is fill yourself yourself up with good. So I have four things that you can do. Um, The first thing is have positive people, positive influences in your life, like how I was talking about how I look up to Sadie. You have positive pastors, youth pastors, people that you look up to that um, are just good influences on you. Another thing is you have to set a routine. I think this is so important, especially for me because I'm a routine type person. We talked about this whenever we got home from the ramp, all of like the youth, and we were talking about how every morning like you need to set a time where you have that time with God because if you don't, then you're thinking, okay, well, I woke up late, I'll do it tonight. Oh, I have homework, I'll have dinner, I'll just do it in the morning. And then sometimes you can just push it around. So I think it's really important that you set a routine and say, okay, I'm going to wake up early, and at this time I'm going to do this every single day. So you can do it every single day. Another thing is read. I think I love reading. No one in my high school like likes reading like I do. Like I'm probably the only one in my grade that like, loves reading. Um, but personally, like obviously read your Bible all the time. But I also like reading like books like Sadie. I talk about her all the time. Um, I love Sadie and I love a whole bunch of other books like Terry Spofoy. And I read that because I feel like it like stimulates your brain and like it helps me look up to certain people like them. Okay. And another thing is write your thoughts in words. I think this is, I'm like a really big journalist. So this is kind of like a thing I like to do, but there's so many reasons that I do that. Like these journals, ever since I got home from the ramp, I would always like journal every single day. And I would write down things, because I'm also a sentimental person, so I like go back and read them sometimes. So for two reasons I did this. I'll go back and read where I was at in life and what I was praying for, so that I can see those things came to pass. And another thing is, sometimes your notes can even call you out. For example, I'll be really real with you guys. One time, I was, uh, I was at a certain place in life, and I wasn't being the best version of me that I could be. And one day I was looking for like this word or something that I heard at church. So I was going through my journal and I opened like this random page. And so I just ended up reading about like what was going on in my life at that time. And I was like, wow, like I was doing so good because I was having this certain amount of time with God every single day. And I slowly kind of let that slip away for that time. And I was like, I was doing so much better because of having that time every day. So like my notes like called me out. So personally, I just think that's like a good thing to do. So you can pour into yourself so that you can pour into others. Like waiters, whenever you go out and eat, they pour, they pull up a pitcher and then they go to everyone's individual cups and pour it up. And then they go up and they get more water. And I think that's so important because the individuals don't have to go and get their own water. You have a pitcher. And it's really important that whenever they go and pour out into other people, they don't stop there. They go back every single day and fill up themselves. So I kind of mentioned this earlier, but you have to prepare for temptation because it's going to come. You have to prepare for the enemy's attacks because the enemy doesn't just attack random things just because he wants to. He only attacks things that, he, that are good, things that he wants to stop because he sees the potential inside of you and he doesn't want that to happen. So you just have to be able to prepare for warfare. What I did whenever I was praying about this is I wrote in the back of my journal, I'll read it for you guys, and it was um, how to prepare for temptation. Let me get it real quick. It says... Uh, Okay, I was, so, okay, the first thing was put in your AirPods. That was the first thing I said. Whenever temptation arises, play worship music and start praying to God. And then I wrote down things that, like, reminded me of God's peace. And the reason I did that is because whenever I could feel temptation coming around me or the enemy was about, I felt like the enemy was trying to attack me, I would put in my AirPods to block out the noise around me. And I would just pray to God and spend that time with him so that I would be close to him. And no matter what situation I was in. So, in closing... Every time I think about personal revival, I always think of fire. I don't know why, but like it just like goes together to me. Um, so I think of whenever you're building a fire, first, what do you have to do? You have to clear off some land. You have to clear off a spot in the ground. Then you put wood on there. Then you start the fire. But then it's, you don't just leave the fire there. You have to make sure to protect it from the wind and rain. And then you have to keep on adding to it. And it's just like that in our lives. We have to clear off the land. We have to um, ask for forgiveness for our sins. And then we start putting the wood down. And then we start our fire. 
but it's, mo it's really important that we protect our fire from other people getting in. Personally, I think other people's opinions are like water to your flame. So you have to be careful that you don't let other people try to water you out. So the most important part is whenever you are burning on fire, it starts spreading to other people. And that's exactly what God has called us to do. When our personal revival becomes so strong, it starts spreading, and that's how you start real revival. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Yeah, it's a good day. It's a real good day, and it's only getting better. I'm telling you, we're going to experience something. Uh, we'll call it second altar after the, after the word. It's uh, the Lord is doing something really, really strong. We were in pre-service prayer and I was praying. I felt the Lord say that he's just going to bring his love like a blanket down today. And there's going to be a deep love of the father. And the word I heard was he was going to fill every crack and crevice of every single person. So in areas that you're lacking, the love of the father is going to show up in a strong way. And and then I just really felt that, you know, even though the, the world is frustrating and fears, it seems to be everywhere. The Lord is going to push people through that really have their mind and heart set on him. And then right when I did that, Mr. Sid Roth texted me and said, hey, it's no longer Halloween. It's Smooth Selling Sunday. I just rebranded this day. And I said, okay, so today it's Smooth Selling Sunday. And it was so cool because this is my opening statement that I wrote down. We are strategically positioned for God's glory to be his voice, which means no matter what comes at us, we are going to have a smooth selling Sunday and we're going to be an active voice for him. And God is strategically, see today's message, it's, it's about you. Like this, this word is directed to you. It's directed to me. And sometimes you have to figure out the individual word that God has for you. It's just a very strategic time. Three things that you're about to start hearing about a whole lot more is fresh moves of God happening. But also, I want you to think fresh moves of God in your personal life. As Malachi said, you need to be in a personal revival at all times. See, we look, oh, well, this church is in revival. This church isn't. But when you look at yourself, you're the only person that can determine if you're having personal revival or not. And so angelic activities. I don't know about you, but you need to read about angels. You need to study about angels. You need to read uh, Tim Sheets' books about angels. Angelic activity is happening at a degree like people have never seen before. And you're going to see, why do so many people in the church world fight against apostles and prophets? Because they are declaring the word of the Lord and they are building on the word of the Lord. You need to align yourself with what God is doing, what God is saying, and be a part of the building process because God is building something strong right now. You need to do something as an individual, and then you need to do something um, with a corporate body, and then also you need to pray about how do you align yourself with Israel? How do you align yourself with the poor, the needy? The Bible says take care of the widow and the orphan. A lot of times people aren't walking and thriving and blessed in life because they're not taking care of the things that God has told them to take care of. The Bible is so simple and, and it is so easy to understand, but nobody hardly does that because they're not aligned properly. They're so focused on their needs. But when they have a kingdom mindset through the Holy Spirit and the written word of God, God will navigate you to get you in the place that your personal life can walk according to the kingdom and the kingdom mindset and you yourself can produce the glory of God. Are y'all tracking with me on this? Okay. So that's what is going on right now. Acts 2, 17, 18. And it shall come to pass in the last day, says God, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh and your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your young men will see vision. Your old men shall have dreams. Okay. I got dreams and visions. I, I'm not I'm not the youngest, but I'm not the oldest. I'm in the middle. And so I get the best of both worlds. I get a little vision and a little dream. And it says, and your mid servants and your maid servants, and I will pour out my spirit in those days and they shall prophesy. I'm going to tell you something. You got to learn how to prophesy. You have to learn how to fight with the written word. The word is called a sword because it is a weapon of mass destruction. You 
Now, Big Nanny slapped me over the head with the word one time. That's used out of context. It's not that type of weapon. She said, I need to get this word in you. She, I was eating, and she walked behind me and went, wham, and slapped me in the back of the head. I said, Nanny, that's not what the Bible meant, okay? But it's not that type of weapon. But it is a weapon, and you have to learn how to fight with your prophetic words. When, when a situation comes against you like, oh, no, devil, that's not what the prophetic word is over my life. I'm not going to believe that report. See, right now, our world is fighting for power. Everybody's fighting. Political parties are fighting. Businesses are fighting. But the power that everybody is truly looking for is the power of God. And when you understand that you are part of the government of God, the kingdom of God, you will start to move and navigate differently. You operate at, at a di different mindset. Okay, let me tell you one of the biggest praise reports I've had in a long time. And if you've flown commercially recently, you will understand what I'm talking about. This was a miracle of God itself. So I, before I got ready to fly out this weekend, this week, I said, God, I declare that all of my flights will leave early and they will arrive early. And so my first flight was early. My second flight was early. And when I got ready to come home, I said, Lord, I declare that my first flight from Charlotte to Dallas will be early. And so I got on the plane, and this sweet little Hispanic lady sat by me. We're talking. She said, my flight's been delayed for eight hours. And the guy behind me said, huh, mine's been delayed for 12. And the guy beside him said, mine's been delayed for 14. I said, y'all are riding with the right person. We're going to leave early. They're like, huh, we'll see. And I said, okay. And all of a sudden they said, uh, this is kind of different and weird, but everybody is here, massive jet. It was a 321. Uh, everybody is here, so we're actually going to be leaving about 10 minutes early today. And I said, all right. And so we, we got to Dallas and got ready to fly back to Texarkana on, on that little jet crop duster. And, and so they got ready, and once again they said, uh, we're actually going to be leaving about 12 minutes early because everybody is here and on time. And I'm just like, Wow. And I, that might sound silly to you, but I don't like sitting in airports at all. So I was declaring something. And because time is valuable and I have a whole lot to do for the kingdom of God. And so I really, that might be silly to some of you, but, but I, I said that in, in complete faith that things were going to happen, that things were going to move forward in, in things. And you got to understand that Genesis 1:26 through 28 then God said, let us make man in our image according to the likeness, and let us have dominion over the, the fish of the sea, the birds of the air and over the cattle and all the things of the earth that are creeping. And it goes on to say, so God created man in his own image. You're, you're made in the image of God. You got to understand that. In the image of God, he created male and female. He created them. Now, here's the best part. Genesis 1, 28. Then God blessed them and he said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, and have dominion. Most people don't, don't take the authority they've been given. It's like somebody's sitting there and they're starving to death, and they got $1,000 in the bank and keys to a car, and a Walmart is a mile down the road, and there's some good restaurants right down the road, and they refuse to go. No, you've got dominion, power, and authority as a child of God to declare and decree a thing and it shall come to pass. But most people don't understand who they are in the Lord. Therefore, they don't walk in that power. All right. We got 17% of the people in the church today ready to have personal revival. Okay, here we go. Matthew 16, 19. And I give you the keys of heaven's kingdom realm to forbid on earth that which is forbidden in heaven and to release on earth which is released in heaven. Okay, hang on. If you got the keys to the kingdom and you got dominion, why aren't you using it? Why, why aren't you? It's like you're trying to get in your house and you can't get in your house and you actually have a key in your pocket. You have authority. You have dominion. I mean, that's what it says in Luke 10, 19. It said, behold, I've given you power and authority and, you, and people set on it. You got to learn how to make declarations and decrees from the word of God, align it with the prophetic word of God and move into that. Isaiah 20, excuse me, 61 and 2, it says, rise up in splendor and be radiant. Okay, I'm going to stop right there. The glory of God actually means splendor and his majesty and righteousness. So when you read the word splendor, 
That is a word used to describe the actual glory of God. So rise up in the glory of God and be radiant for your light has dawned and Yahweh's glory now streams from you. Look carefully. Darkness blankets the whole earth. Sounds a little like 2021. And the thickness glooms over the nations. Nah. But Yahweh arises up. He rises up upon you and the brightness of his glory appears over you. Remember a few weeks ago when I talked about Goshen? I don't care what the report is over America. I do care. But I don't care. The report over America will not be my outcome. My outcome will be what I say it's going to be because I'm aligned properly with God. It's just going to happen that way. It's just going to happen the way the Holy Spirit tells me it's going to happen. And I'm not, I'm so hard headed. I'm not going to settle for anything else. Why do you, me, sometimes people watching online, why do we settle for things that do not align with the word of God? Sometimes you got to fight for some things that you want. You got to go on a fast. You, you got to read. You got to pray. Do things happen instantly for me? No. But I'm going to fight for it. I actually prayed for three days over those flights because I knew I did not want to be stuck in an airport for a lot of days. And so I started, I mean, that might be silly to you, but I wanted to be early, not on time, early. And so I started praying. There's things in my life I've been praying into, and I'm going to shake heaven and earth. That's what it said in Matthew 16, 19. We have keys. You need to start unlocking some things. What's behind door number one? You know, you got doors out there that are waiting for you. I was uh, prophesying over some people this week at a meeting I was doing, and I just said, man, I just see doors and treasure chest inside of you. And this guy started crying, and somebody said, man, this guy has more potential but won't do a thing with it. He has more inside of him. And I said, man, God's telling you, you got the keys to the kingdom. Start using them. He's given everybody gifts, talents, and abilities. It's time for people to rise and shine because the glory of God is upon you. Psalms 119, 9, 11. It says, how can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. With my whole heart, I have sought after you, and I will not wander from your commandments. Your word I've hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. When If you could understand what God has for you, you will not sin against him. Your mind will be fixed on the things of God, and you will walk in the things that the Lord has called you to. There's a revival happening right now in America in the churches, it's a little different than a lot of people are expecting it to look like. But there is a revival in the churches, and it's going to rock the American church to the core. The, I mean, the, what the Lord is doing, he's about to realign some things in his church and the culture of the church that you're going to see people that are not going for the things of God and aligning with the things of the Holy Spirit. It's going to be rough on them. I'm just going to tell you, it's going to be rough. Because when the Lord moves and operates, he doesn't want people operating out of their own flesh. He wants them operating out of the gifts, talents, and abilities that he has actually given them through the leading of the Holy Spirit. Now, he is ready for people to walk and operate in that. And I know awakening is coming to America, and it's about to start hitting regions. It's about to start hitting regions and ministries that want nothing more than the very presence of God, to be a presence-driven church. And the thing is about this word is this word is not about a church service. It is about you every day of your life. We are the church. and We are going to experience outpourings. And so here's what I want to ask you. God is offering, as Malachi said, a personal revival today. How are you going to steward it? And what are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with your personal revival? Are you going to be like the Bible where it says there was a light and had a cup over it? Or are you going to let your light be, be like a city upon a hill? You are offered a personal revival from the Lord and things are about to change. Now, there's nine things that I wrote down that I want you to understand that what God is actually doing. Actually, this right here was an article I wrote for Charisma a long time ago. The Lord told me to pull it up 
But instead of talking about the church, talk about people individually. So number one, to move forward with the Lord in this day that we're in, number one, you got to have great expectancy. Matthew 5 and 6, blessed are those who are hunger and thirst for righteousness. One of the, the three things that explains the glory of God is righteousness. When you think about what the kingdom of God is, one of the things the kingdom of God is, it is righteousness when you really study out that word. So the glory of God and the kingdom of God, actually the word righteousness, those that hunger and thirst for righteousness, that I want to be a spotless vessel. Am I spotless? Lord Jesus, no. But I'm trying to get there. It's just taking me a while, but I'm on the right path. And so God is asking us to have great expectation. When I pray for somebody to be healed, if they're not, I'm baffled. If they are, I'm excited, but it's kind of like, well, what did you expect? I mean, we prayed. What did you really expect? My good friend Chris Mathis put this online. He said what we're calling uh, revival church, signs, wonders, and miracles in the early church was just normal Christianity. We, we, we just got to get back. To the, we're not even at the foundation. We're, we're like down here in the, in the basement, the cellar. What we're crying out to God for was the very foundation that was set over 2,000 years ago. We're just trying to get to that foundation to where signs, wonders, and miracles happen. And so, number one, you've got to have a great expectation. On, do you expect to win in life, to thrive in life, in, your, in your, your life, your walk with God, your marriage, your business, ministry, whatever you do? Do you expect to, to thrive? I expect to win in everything that I do. But besides that little Jenga game or whatever, I always lose to Ezra. But um, I just, I expect to be who God called me to be and to do exactly what he called me to do. Number two, this is what you got to get ready for. There's about to be an increased power and presence of God on your life. But let me tell you this. Everybody usually says, yeah, great, that's awesome. No, it's about to scare you. You are going to walk in the power of presence of God to a degree it will scare you. You will start to be talking to an old friend and God will give you a prophetic word. There'll come such a prophetic anointing on you, it will, it will scare you. You will start walking in business ideas that will scare you. You will be doing business with people twice your age, and you will have better insight in your business, Austin, these people twice your age. You're just going to start walking in things, and things are about to start coming to you. I was actually doing some prophetic ministry this week for, for some people in a ministry, and I'll be honest, there was a prophetic anointing on me that was scary, like literally just I've never walked in anything like that. And the Lord said, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Tell people to get ready. I'm about to anoint some people who will die in the flesh. So there's an increased amount of power and presence of God coming. Get ready for it. Now what happens when you're full of the spirit, it won't bother you, but your flesh will get scared for what the Lord's doing. You know what the hardest test in the world is? The test of success. And a lot of people are scared of being successful. So get ready for that. Number three. Well, I just kind of talked about it. I jumped ahead. Uh, increased amount of the prophetic. You're going to see people that aren't prophetic prophesying. The Bible says that the Spirit of God will be poured out on all flesh. If you can hear Holy Spirit, if you don't prophesy and you're talking to somebody and the Holy Spirit said, tell this person this, you're about to prophesy. You don't have to be a prophet to do that. But you can have, you, don't, you might not walk in the office, but you can have an ear to hear the Lord. Don't be scared. Step out. You already step out this week? Lindsay, you ready to step out this week? Okay. It's going to hit you hard. And so I'm telling you, people are going to start stepping out in a big way. Number four. Hey, let's stop real quick. I remember Cameron told me a story about a few weeks ago that they were at the Flying Burger and Seafood Restaurant. And just him and the people his wish just said something about, hey, how's your, how's your knee or something like that? And they're like, what do you, what do you mean? Just my knee? And they just prayed. Went back and checked on healed. Prophetic word. Somebody stepped out. Somebody got healed. Wouldn't that be cool if that was you this week? It will be. So just, just move in it. Just, hey, uh, I was talking to someone the other day, and my shoulder started hurting like really bad. And I said, this is crazy, but my shoulder hurts some, but it's really hurting. Is your shoulder? They said, which shoulder? I said, the left shoulder. They said, where in the left shoulder? And I pointed. They're like, exactly. We prayed. Both shoulders start hurting. Step out. You're going to start hearing stuff like that. Stuff like that is going to start happening to people. Okay? All right. Number four, prayer meetings are going to be formed. You know, we pray at 7 o'clock. 
on Tuesday nights. But there's times that the Lord may say something like, hey, I want you to pray at 12 to 1, five days this week. I'll be like, okay, and I'll set up. Just when God asks you to do a special prayer meeting, it's for a reason, okay? So step in to that. Jeremiah 33 and 3, call to me and I will answer you, okay? He's basically telling you to keep your phone on you, keep your ringer on because he's about to call you and he's going to tell you something. And then he said, I'm going to show you great and mighty things which you don't know. One of the things that Autumn was talking about as she was ministering was just about it's your time for that breakthrough. Sometimes you just need one word from the Lord and that one word will change everything. And what did she say? This week you will receive your breakthrough. It's going to happen. All right, the next one is people are about to start confessing sin and they're going to raise their standard of living. One of the things that I do every day if I have a time of repentance when I get in my daily time, I'm praying, I'm seeking the Lord, I start repenting for different things because I want to be spotless. I want to be blameless. I just want to say, all right, Lord, I just want to, this is what I ask for forgiveness for. But then if I have sinned or done something or said something or thought something, let me know so I can get it out. I do not want anything taking root in my heart. Hey, there's a lot of crazy folks in the world. There's only 3% of us, I think, in America that's really sane right now. But being around folks out there, man, you just got to say, Lord, whatever that person said, I pray that I don't take any root or harbor any bitterness towards it. So you can, see, your walk with God is, is like a, a garden. You got to garden it, tend to it every single day. And so you can't get stale. And, and uh, number six is you will find people studying old revivals and purchasing books and listening to podcasts on them. When you hear, uh, I'm a revival junkie, I love listening to people about old revival and they all started all revivals in the place of prayer that's why i love prayer because if we're going to start something like malachi was saying about it always starts with people in personal revival till it goes to corporate revival and one thing over this house is we're going to be a house full of signs wonders and miracles is this going to happen at a greater degree than any of us ever even seen or expected um uh, the next number seven. Oh, yeah, this is the fun one. Y'all like the fun ones? Increase attacks and criticism from others in your region. This is, say, the nation. Uh, you're going to receive it. That's great. Who cares what they say? Other people's opinions don't pay your bills or, or fund your ministry or help your business or you just keep going. Don't listen to people. Listen, do you know why I'm not talking bad about people? Because I got way too much business of my own. When you get your own, Big Nanny used to always say, when you get your own business, you'll stay out of mine. <laughs> so, so find out what, you, what you, you're called to do. And people, they like to talk about others because they don't want to work on their self. Most times when people come against you, they see you doing something that they internally want to be doing. So walk in and listen, just love on people. people. People are jacked up. Just love on them. Because if you fire back at them, you may break a relationship that God actually called you to be the bigger person. And so I had somebody say something really negative to me the other day on, online. And I just, oh, man, come on. Just give me a shout. He called me. I just loved him for about five minutes. And, and I, just, he, I said, man, look, you ain't mad at me. You're okay. And uh, he said, man, forgive me. I'm sorry. I said, we're good. I got to go, though. You're irritating me. And but I was nice to him, you know, and I just loved on him. I didn't fire back at him, but I just said, hey, bud, look, you're mad. You're frustrated. This is why I think you're mad. He said, you're right. I said, let's just, we're, we're still friends. All right. We're just good. And so, number eight, you will find a shift in people's private time with God, and they will have a new outlook on life and ministry. And I think people are going to start seeing in the ways of the kingdom of God. They're going, to, they're going to actually see what Jesus did and do what he did and understand because the Bible clearly states that you can actually have the mind of Christ. If you're always mad and frustrated and can't figure things out, you're probably not operating in the mind of Christ. That's why Mark 135 says Jesus got up early in the morning and went to a solitary place where he prayed. Mark 646, he basically pushed the disciples away. Then he went and spent time with the Lord. He always stayed time with the Father so he could keep his mind sharp. You got to keep your mind sharp in this day and age. And number nine, you'll start to see signs, wonders, and miracles in the church and outside of the church from, from its members. And they will tell stories about what is happening during the week. You're going to start 
seeing that the supernatural is about to manifest. And if you ever study and really read about the times of Jesus, there's times that Jesus would take his disciples to places where it was just pagan everywhere. And he would say, is this what you want? Or do you want what I have to offer? Why did people hate Jesus so much? Because he always talked about a kingdom and the religious rulers, I mean, the governmental rulers were bad, but the church folks was the worst. And so they would get mad when he would talk about his kingdom because it was messing with their kingdom. But when we truly die to our thoughts and ambitions and we just give it to the Lord, things are going to happen. Damon Thompson said something one time that I didn't understand, but I am now. When you don't need something is when you're going to get it. Because when you're completely surrendered to the Lord, like completely, completely, you won't have a lot of earthly ambition. That's when God can use you. Because when you're doing things and you're prospering and it's feeding your ego, it's hard for God to get any glory out of that. But when you really don't need anything like that, God can use you. He wants people to be laid down lovers for him. And so... I just really feel that there's going to be some powerful ministry at the altar. I, it, it, there's two things going to happen. One, I feel like the love of the Father is going to fall like a blanket, just a blanket just wrapping around you. The, the word I got in pre-service prayer was every crack and crevice, like as a broken vessel, he's going to just start filling. But then we're going to lay hands for healing. And we're going to prophesy over some people. And the Lord is going to move. But here's the thing. All that's cool. But that's not, that's not the main thing. Getting a word from God is the most important thing. I remember one time the Lord spoke to me and said, I want to take you to the place of prayer. I got something I want to tell you. I'm like, well, I'm excited about that. So I went to the Lord. And God gave me a word. And I wrote the word down over the next 72 hours literally over 20 people told me that that word was not from God and they came against it and the person that uh, the person that the word had something to do with along with myself and then all of a sudden the Lord said see if I wouldn't have given you that word you might not have believed it it's one of the greatest things that's ever happened to me but everybody that had good advice didn't have God advice God's voice has to be the strongest voice in your life. You know, there's a lot of people here that this isn't your home church. I don't know where you go to church. Listen, your pastor's voice cannot be stronger than the voice of God. For the people here at Roar, my voice cannot be the number one voice in your life. It has to be the Holy Spirit's voice. I am supposed to help you and give you confirmation and help you navigate some natural things but you have to get a word from the Lord and know what he's called you to do. Because when you get a supernatural word, natural people cannot talk you out of it. But when you're operating the flesh, any old joker and smooth talker can talk you out of your calling. But when you know that you know that you know, man, when, when, when the Lord spoke to me and said, Autumn was my wife. I was really excited. And I bet I honestly had 25 men tell me there's no way she'll marry you. And they told me how awesome she was and how petty I was. And they can give me all these reasons. A girl like that will never marry a guy like you. And there's all these different people say, oh, I don't know if you should marry him and all this. But you know what? We both had a word from God. Things are rolling pretty good. And you know what? God called me to ministry. Man, I still was stuttering and different things. And people said, man, you can't, can't hardly read, man. You stutter. You can't talk. You're afraid to get in front of people. I'm like, hmm. And I wasn't smart enough to even listen to him. I just, well, God told me something. And I just went and did it. And so I remember when I was young, I was 16 years old at First Baptist New Boston. They were singing, I Surrender All. I felt the Lord said he called me to ministry. And I looked at my friend on my my right, and I told him, and they said, man, you, you can't be a preacher. You don't even have a tie. And uh, he said, the pastor, he's got a tie on. And then I said, God, I'm hey, man, God told me I'm going to be a preacher like that guy up there, Brother Cox. And he said, no, man, you stutter. You don't really read your Bible, and you really don't serve the Lord that, that much. I said, well, I'm a Christian. I just, you know, just kind of hanging out. And they said, you'll never. So I just kind of pushed that aside. Why? I didn't have a strong relationship with them. 
But when I have a great relationship, now I give people prophetic things. Oh man, God said, I'm going to do this, this, and this. And people are like, there's no way you'll ever do that. I'm never telling you nothing again because you're a liar. And uh, I would just sit back on my dreams and everything he said I was going to do, I'm doing it. Just did one last week. And he told me something I was going to do five years ago and I did it this week. And you know, the thing is, he just keeps saying it. So you believe every word he said. And I rebuke in the name of Jesus every word somebody said that you weren't going to do. When God said you're going to do it, you're going to do it. You're going to do it with kingdom fashion, with the glory of God and anointed. And while you're doing it, you will have people talking bad about you every step of the way. Spend your energy on prayer, not firing back at them. Because the ones that come against you, he will probably call you to go back and minister to later. Don't burn that bridge. The Lord gave me three people. He gave me three people that I do not like at all in this world. And he said, you will minister to all three of them. And I said, yes, sir. And I will sow into their ministries. I will be nice. I will be kind. And I will fast and pray for them. And he said, you sure will. I said, okay, yes, sir. You got it. I'll do exactly what you told me to because I value my anointing. And if I don't do what you've called me to. See, I don't pick and choose my assignments. I just say, yes, sir, a whole lot. When you just say, yes, Lord, it won't be what you wanted. Here's the thing. You'll do a lot of stuff you probably don't want to do, but he'll give you stuff and bless you in ways you never could even imagine. Because when you go into ministry, your ministry may be a school teacher. You may be a nurse. You may be a politician. You may be, who knows what you may be. You may be a preacher. Listen, you got to do what he's calling you to do. Be respectful to people. But don't listen to what people tell you unless it aligns with what God himself told you. Okay? I think that's all I'm going to say. And so, oh, no, no, I'm not. I'm going to say one more thing. Maybe. A few more. Uh, just kidding. Just kidding. Bam. I'm going to say something that you don't learn in church. And, and people won't ever tell you this. But I'm going to tell you this. When, when you get a word from God, you don't need my approval. You don't need your, if you go to another church, we got as many visitors here today as regular folks. Uh, you don't have to have, yes, you need your pastors and people to speak into your life, but you, a lot of times in the past, people tried to control people. Listen, I'm Jojo. He is God. Your pastor is just your pastor, but God's God. And you know what? This is crazy. But before I got my degree, I went back to kindergarten until I got my degree. Did you know I went to six different schools? Maybe in life you go to different ministries because they all teach different things. There's a lot of things we really don't teach here that are good. But you go to, I went to kindergarten, and then I went to elementary, then I went to junior high, then high school. Then I started at one college, and then I shifted over into ministry stuff, and then I finished. Actually, there were seven schools. And so a lot of times in life, I don't know who this is for, But you're going to get fed from different ministries. You're going to get fed from different ministers. You're going to sow into different places. And so God is just breaking the whole mindset. I love when I ask people, hey, man, who who are you reading? What what are you reading? What are you watching? And when people tell me about different people that they're listening to, because if the Bible says nobody's perfect, no, not one, you can't have one preacher. That's why we got so many different people in our church that speak. You need different outlooks, different gifts. You know, the fivefold. You don't need just one gift. You need all five operating. You need different prophets and apostles and teachers. You need just all types of different things. I don't know where I'm going with any of this, but it's for somebody to understand you need voices. Now, if you're going to be in a house, you need to be committed and you need to be a part of it. Now, this is for somebody, nobody from our place, but But if God tells you to leave, this is something that this is important to teach. When somebody joins a church, everybody loves them. God said, come here, that's great. But when somebody wants to leave a church, they say, oh no, God didn't say that. It doesn't really happen like that. If you trust somebody to be in your church and to be a leader, if they want to leave, you should bless them the same way you welcomed them. And so don't ever let somebody, like the last three or four people that's left here, they were like, I had no idea leaving a church was so easy. I said, well, first of all, you're not my people, you're God's people. And so I just, I'm just going to guess that somebody's been hurt from that in the past. That's why I'm saying it. When we start praying for people, you'll get healed from that. And don't ever let anybody damage your spirit, man, when you're following the Lord. 
Now, that's kind of an iffy statement because you do need people. The Bible says where there's no counsel, plans will go astray. You need somebody that counsels you. But there's been times, I'm sure I've tried to help people and it was wrong, and people have told me, no, you can't do this when the Holy Spirit says, yes, you can. That makes sense. Sail on that and let that word just resonate in your spirit. It was for somebody. Problem is, when you say something like that, most people who, it's not not for them, they receive and the one that was for went, Phew. okay? The Holy Spirit will tell you if that's for you. I just feel like there's a lot of people in here that's been hurt. And it wasn't from God. But, but remember this, here's the hardest thing you'll ever do in your life, in my opinion, to forgive the people who hurt you let me tell you what God did one time. He got my pocketbook. There's some folks I would not forgive. I just didn't like them. The Bible said you got to love them. You ain't got to like them. I still don't like them, but I love them. Okay? And so the Lord said, send them all a $100 check. And I'm like, whoa. And I wrote them a $100 check and sent it to them. And the Lord said, forgive them. I forgave them real quick because I'm obedient to the Lord. Did you know all those people messaged me and said, thank you for that check. We need to settle our differences. I'm like, it was only $100. Uh, I bought for $300 my peace back. I bought peace for $300. $300 for the win. But they were waiting on me to make the step, and I was waiting on them to make the step. But I just I said, Lord, uh, and Lord should give them this and write them a letter. And it was just, I don't know, it was something silly I wrote probably, but a scripture. And uh, we don't have to say this about a scripture. Um, and, it, and it solved it. Now every time I see them, it's all good. Little things like that will set you free. I'm really done. I'm going to pray. And then I have no idea what's about to happen. Besides, they're going to play. And Andy's going to play real good on the drums. And we're going to pray over people. We're going to lay hands. We're going to prophesy. Um, Doc, raise your hand. He likes to pray for healing. Um, so he'll be up here and just, if you, if you need healing, just, just come up. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to clear your mind. I want you to say, God, my mind, my heart is a blank canvas today. I want to be so kingdom minded that the natural realm cannot even mess with me. The spirit realm. You know, it says in Matthew 6, 10 in the, the passion, it says manifest your kingdom realm and then that we are to flow in the Holy Spirit and we basically override everything in the natural. Manifest your kingdom realm. We need that kingdom thinking today. Also, as I'm setting up here, I just feel the Lord is saying, some of you are going to start dreaming. You're going to start dreaming two ways. Naturally, yeah, like, you know, God will give you a dream to go after in life, but you're going to dream with the Lord and it's going to be so plain and so clear, it's going to make sense to you. When, when, you're, when your mind is hurt, confused, and you don't know what to think or do, that will set you free. That will set you free, a dream. So, Lord, I just declare, as Michelle joins with me in prayers, we're praying that dream anointing will hit people. Just that dream anointing is going to hit, and people are going to have prophetic dreams and it will be to move them forward or answer questions they have. I just thank that and thank you, Lord. And I speak that over their life in the mighty name of Jesus.